just gonna go live a couple of minutes early. Let's see. Awesome. Okay, hi. Oh, I got three people watching apparently. Um, thank you for joining. You actually joined me a little bit early. I'm just testing that my computer can handle this at the minute. Get to see a little bit of a uh, little bit of setup. Just so that you know, I was specifically requested to fly from this airport because the terminal looks a bit like a penis. Yes. Uh, honestly, that's that's the that's God's honest truth. <laughs> hey, how you doing, Metal Wolf? Right. Okay. So it seems like we can manage playing the game with all the other windows and bits and pieces I've got open. So, swap to that side. There we go. As you can see, there is the penis-shaped. Uh, there is the penis-shaped terminal. Busy car park. Okay. Oh, I picked the wrong. Never mind. I picked the wrong. Uh, Pick the one gate, but we'll make do. Over here. I'm just going to wait to actually go live. Uh, I've got a tweet ready. Go out. Oh, apparently the tweet's already gone out. Okay, so it's a cold day today. It's a cold day in uh, Saskatoon. I think that's how it's said, Saskatoon. So let's go ahead and turn the aircraft on. So let's turn our batteries on, connect to the outside power, make sure that these two generators are on, which they are. We are going to turn on the APU and get that started. Wait for this to say available. It is a lovely day today in uh, Canada, but the weather is quite cold. I don't know if it will say. No, I need to turn some more systems on first. But when I was playing it earlier, I was getting temperatures of minus 30, minus 40. So it should be interesting. Okay, so we've got the APU on. So we're going to go ahead and turn on the anti-ice and window heat. Put on the bacon light, nav light. Um, do we need any other lights on? Quite a sunny day today, isn't it? I don't think we need any more lights. I think we're all right. How is it? Oh, but um, the temperature that I had was when I was about 16,000 feet into the sky, so uh, that might be why there's a bit of discrepancy. Uh, okay, so let's just check that we've got everything. Turn on our fuel pumps. Let's turn on our seatbelt lights. 
And I believe I should be able to just start the engine now. Yep, there we go. And I'll also go ahead. Even though a pilot would never do this, um, I will turn on the other engine at the same time. I'm also going to go ahead and get our initial uh, autopilot set up. I already know the flight plan is going to be heading. Um, we're going to be using runway 9 -er. Whilst we're on the ground, we'll put that down. Okay, how are our engines doing? Ah, oh, they're getting there. Getting there. Thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoy yourself. Don't forget, um, in case you aren't aware, later on I will be doing a presentation on the history of flight. I really hope you enjoy it. Look, there's another player over there. I can't quite make out what he's flying, but... Anyway, I think that was another player. It might have actually been a car. All I know is the map says there's another player there. Look, see? That's me. That's the other player. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tune to Winnipeg Radio. We're going to request IFR clearance. We've already got our flight plan built into the computer. Uh, there we go. So we are flying from Saskatoon to Calgary. The flight should take roughly one hour, there, thereabouts. Um, and we are going to take a bit of an extended landing just so that we partially fly over the mountains because it is a lovely sight to see on this game, flying over those mountains. So, I'm going to go ahead and request IFR clearance. So, who am I calling? Winnipeg. Um... Penguin 1123, request IFR clearance, flying Charlie Yankee Yankee Charlie to Char... Nope. Charlie Yankee X Re Echo to Charlie Yankee Yankee Charlie. Winnipeg Radio Penguin 1123 IFR to Calgary, ready to copy. Oh, okay. Penguin 1123 is cleared to Calgary Airport as filed. Climb and maintain 11,000 feet. Departure frequency is 133.1 squawk 4313. We'll read that back. I'm gonna ha go ahead. One one two three clear to Calgary Airport as filed. To... Climb and maintain eleven thousand feet. Departure is one three three decimal one squad four three one three. Clearance oh. point thirty minutes from now. Penguin one one two three read back correct. Okay, awesome. I'm now gonna tune to the. Tune to the airfield that we're at. This is not a... What's the word I'm looking for? This isn't a... It, this airport isn't busy enough where someone will tell me when and where I can go. I declare things and they're recorded for um, collection purposes. Right, so I have to make sure I pick the right runway. Taking off runway 9. I'm going to taxi to runway 9. Saskatoon traffic penguin 1123 is taxiing to runway nighter. Oh, whilst we're here, I almost forgot to do this. Those on to normal and disconnect from the external power. And we'll turn off the APU as well. We don't need that on anymore. Okay, because of how slow the, uh, the pushback is, I'm actually going to go ahead and just use reverse thrust.
Hey, come on. There we go. Oh, you're trying to be awkward, are you? This is the first time it's made me taxi in this direction. Usually I taxi uh, uh, heading north, whereas this time it wants me to turn around and head south. Okay, I think we're about ready. Go ahead and get ourselves on the runway. Or taxi to the runway. So just, uh, just to make you all aware, this time we're actually going to take quite a low altitude for our cruise. We're going to be flying at 16,000 feet, though I am seeing quite a bit of cloud coverage. So if we end up inside the clouds, I will ask to reduce our... Altitude traffic to Sierra, Lima, Quebec, 72011 miles, West I will ask to reduce our cruise altitude, just so that you can see the wonderful, wonderful scenery. Saskatoon traffic to Sierra, Lima, Quebec, 720 is on final runway. Oh dear. What you can't see is the VFR map. Right now there is someone on the runway who's just sat still doing nothing. Um, and at the same time you just heard a player request permission to land. So that would be a bit interesting. Because they're landing on the runway, sorry, that uh, that person is waiting on. I'm also going to be waiting for that person to clear the runway so that I can take off. Also, after my many test flights, for some reason, it likes to make me s travel down the runway instead of travel down this taxiway, which is specifically so that I can join the runway. Um, so I'm going to ignore the blue line. And we're going to go... We're going to use the correct route. I hope you've all had a great day so far. Well, don't forget, I, I have to turn the uh, I have to turn the quality down because I'm streaming. If I wasn't streaming, I could turn it up. Okay, so we're going to taxi to and hold short of runway 09 or left. Oh, hang on, not 09 or left, sorry, just 09. There's only uh, one runway pointing in this direction here. Okay, so first of all, apparently we have someone on final to land. There they are. Just make out their, um, their wing lights, or their strobe lights even.
So the question now is, do I wait for them to land? Yeah, we'll wait. We'll let them land. We'll be kind. So what we're going to do then is I'm going to put on one notch of flaps. Uh... <laughs> That's fair enough comment, Brent. Another reason why I'm going to wait for them to land is because I still have that joker sat on the runway doing nothing. Though I can't see him. So we'll see. Right, okay. So I am going to... Uh... Oh, no, I've got nothing left to announce. So we're just going to sit here and wait for this guy to come down and land. It shouldn't take too long. Any, um... no. He's just reached the IF. The IFR, the point where the IFR will capture his plane, assuming he's using um, ILS. I meant ILS, by the way, not IFR. Good evening, Hell Monkey. How are you doing? Okay, so, judging by my map, this guy has decided he doesn't want to land, uh, because he's now off course, quite far off course. I mean, he could still turn it around and bring it in, but I'd be surprised. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this guy has decided he's not going to come into land, which is a pain in the backside, because <laughs> he's left me sat here waiting for him. Okay, so I'm going to depart straight out. Saskatoon traffic, Penguin 1123, taking off runway 15 straight oh, I'm not taking off from runway 15. I told you I was... Taking off from runway 09. Saskatoon traffic, Penguin 1123, taking off runway 9 or straight on departure. Okay, there we go. Got a parking brake on. You never know, we might meet this guy in the air once we take off. I have no idea what he's doing, announcing to come in and land and then deciding, oh, I'm not going to land. Not saying that he's cancelled landing intentions. Oh, I guess we can't all be like you, can we, Adam? Anyway, right, so we are now ready to take off. Let's just double check all of our systems are set up correctly. We've got our autopilot set up. Looks like the autopilot is all set up. I'm going to turn on the flight director though. Landing gear is down. Well, obviously it's down, otherwise we wouldn't be moving anywhere. Uh, got our engine set to normal. Parking brake is off. That sorted flaps down to position one. I'm just going to quickly check my lights. I don't think I need. Um, We'll turn on the. We'll, we'll put the strobe light to auto. I don't think we're going to need it. By the way, I want to quickly show you something, right? This is slow. This is the wipers going slow. Since when was that slow? This is fast. Look at that. Anyway, let's get back on. Let's get back on track. Otherwise, we're never going to get to uh, Calgary. Okay, so we're going to start rolling. Fifty. For some reason, this airplane is really pulling today. Right, there we go. 
really pulling. All right, V1, V2, and rotate. Is that a plane at the end of the runway? Oh no, thank God. Okay, so we're going to put away our landing gear, turn on the autopilot, and we're going to put away our flaps. There we go. down into climb there we go uh, so that it automatically sets the throttle for me we're then going to put this on navigation Come on. there we go and the plane should now start getting itself on course oh my goodness something crazy let's update that uh, let's update that altitude shall we okay fantastic hey Zach wonderful so we're up I forgot to tweet out that we uh, are on the runway. Never mind. Okay, fantastic. I'm looking forward to this flight. Let's see if we can spot our crazy friend. There he is. He's de he decided to turn around. If I show you. Okay. So he's now on the... He was on the base leg. I can't remember what this bit's called, but he's coming back in to try and land. So what he should have declared was a missed approach, but he decided it was best not to. I'm going to go ahead and take that back off. I'm spoiling your view. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Where's my... Uh, Winnipeg, uh, say again. Winnipeg Center Penguin 1123, say again. Morning Star 8067, you are 31 miles west. Descend and maintain 3,200 feet. Keep speed below 210 knots. Expect ILS runway 9 approach via saddle transition. Clear to saddle. Climb and maintain 16,000 feet, Penguin 1123. Once we reach our cruising altitude, I'm going to set about five minutes um, until we start the presentation. Uh, there's nothing really else to see here, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off this camera um, as we are flying IF. Yes, we're flying IFR now. So there won't be very much in terms of controls. Maybe next week I'll do VFR, which is all manual, but uh, we'll, we'll see. At least now you can just focus on the uh, the lovely scenery. 
If you were with me for my last flight, you would have uh, seen mostly water because we flew over the English Channel, then we flew over the part of the Atlantic Sea, I believe it was. No. And I think it was Atlantic. I don't know. Let's go ahead and check out our altitude. I'm also going to change this so that you can see more of the journey. In fact, there you can see the whole journey. But uh, that's a bit too far for me. Double check all my systems are set up properly. So the minimum descent, minimum decision altitude. I have no idea what the temperature is, nor the wind, nor the direction. By the way, speaking of wind, this is the current wind, right? 21 knots of wind is not to be sniffed at. If you look at the plane, you might notice that the camera is centered on the plane, but there's an ever so slight tail drift. This is because we've got quite a lot of wind. And the vertical stabilizer, which you might, uh, you might call a rudder, but it's not. This is the rudder. This is the vertical stabilizer. That's because this vertical stabilizer is designed to keep the plane from yawing too much. But the problem is, is if you have wind coming at it from a different angle other than straight on, it will push that vertical stabilizer um, off kilter. Not going to present a huge issue until we come to land, because the runway that we're going to be landing on um, runs perpendicular to this wind, and this is quite a strong wind. So you're going to see me coming down with quite an angle, maybe about 20 degrees, 20, 15, 20 degrees. And this is the live weather, I might add, as well. Oh, just realized we've reached our cruise altitude. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and let people know that the presentation is going to start in five minutes. I'm really excited about this. By the way, I've just seen your tweet. That's really impressive that you could see your own old house. <laughs> really impressed with that. Okay. Yeah, I, I could try turning up the details on the game, but I'm not sure that that would work. Okay, so I'll tell you what, as it is 1756 here, right now, I'm going to go ahead and just say at the, at the top of the hour, we'll go ahead and start the presentation. There's a couple of people near me. Let's see if we can spot them from outside the plane. Okay. Make that smaller. You can see one is roughly in my airway. I'm not sure what his altitude is, but he's quite close to my airway. Very slow as well. And the other one is all the way over. Oh, there he is. We found him straight away. 
That little green dot there. Let's see if we can spot this traffic. Because whilst he might be slow, it does look like he's moving and I don't particularly want to smack into him. titles in this. I'm not quite sure what you mean, Jim. Okay, so he's either above or below, obviously. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's landed, I think. He's down there somewhere. Oh, there he is. There he is. I don't know what he's flying, but it's incredibly slow. He might have uh, got himself like a microlite DLC or something. Oh, a lot of tiles. Yes, yeah, so one thing I've noticed, and I wonder if Metawolf can help me out here, or maybe it's just America and Canada in general. What is going on with all these dead straight roads? What is this? Everywhere I look in this part of Canada, everything seems dead straight until you get to the odd one where they're like, uh, we need to go off a little bit, but then we'll go dead straight again. You guys must hate it if you ever come to England or Europe because there isn't a straight road to be found here. As some of you might have seen, so I'm just going to quickly broach something. As some of you might have seen, I did request um, to use a video by the, that is owned by the BBC. Now, they did reply to me, but it was just about giving me permission. It was about uh, sorting out potentially giving me permission. As it stands, within the last few minutes, they still haven't gotten back to me, so it won't be displayed during this um, presentation. Hopefully, I still have enough in this presentation to um, engage and interest you. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely... Uh, I definitely want to try and get it into a, a later presentation. Six hundred and forty acres. Wow. It just make it makes it look like they've taken pictures at different times of the year. Because everything is built up into grids. Oh, okay, I've just realized we have just we have just crossed the uh, top of the hour. Okay, so let's go ahead and get this going. Present. Bear with me, I just need to tell... You were supposed to wait before doing that. Um, one three two eight for penguin one one two three. One three two decimal eight penguin one one two three. Winnipeg Center. Okay, we don't need you now. realized I turned off everything that I needed to be on. Okay, so we're going to have to go ahead and do I'm going to go ahead and have to do this. Like this. Okay, there we go. Oh, that was scary. I lost, I lost you for a moment then. Okay, so in the background the flight is still going on. Please let me know if it's too loud. 
um, and I will adjust the volume. So, hello and welcome to the first ori Penguin original presentation. We'll be going over the history of flight, covering some key areas of interest and innovation. For those who are watching this presentation live, please feel free to leave your questions and comments in the chat and I will return to them at the end of the show. Unfortunately, the air traffic controller may occasionally cut me off, in which case I do apologise. I reminded him last night that I'd be doing this, but he can be ever so forgetful. So, without further ado, let's get into it. We're going to be starting our journey uh, through time in China, covering the Renaissance, the World Wars, modern aviation and what the future has in store. I'll also mention a couple of aeroplanes that have played a key role, some of which are still flying today. And if anyone's interested, that is a Lancaster bomber, a British-built quad turboprop aircraft used during the Second World War. So we'd start off with a little quote here by Socrates. Man must rise above the earth, to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. Um, yeah, so, interesting man, Socrates. We're going to start in China, 400 BC. Mozi was a Chinese philosopher, but also an extremely skilled carpenter. And together with Lu Ban, who was a Chinese structural engineer, inventor and carpenter, um, they came up with the wooden bird. Luban has been credited for the wooden bird and it is argued to be the first example of a kite. The wooden bird was reportedly capable of remaining airborne for three days. The kite was invented mainly for military purposes and the first kites were used for measuring distances which was useful information for moving large armies across difficult terrain. They could also be used to calculate and record wind readings and provide a form of communication similar to that of ship flags. By the way, I'm not using PowerPoint in case you're wondering. Leonardo da Vinci was an Italian polymath of the High Renaissance who was widely considered one of the most diversely talented individuals to have ever lived. That's a quote taken directly from Wikipedia and I don't disagree. Whilst I can't find an exact figure, many inventions are attributed to da Vinci, including the diving suit, the triple barrel cannon, the parachute, and the ornithopter. In the left image, you can see a drawing of the aerial screw and ornithopter, the former being an equivalent to a helicopter and the latter a kind of glider. Unfortunately, the history books state these, like many of Leonardo's sketches, were never created but it remains an important step in the journey towards heavier-than-air flight. Over in France in 1783, I apologise for the pronunciation if I get it completely wrong, brothers Joseph Michel and Jacques-Étienne Montgolfier were inventors of the first hot air balloon. They used the smoke from a fire to blow hot air into a large silk bag. Attached to the silk bag was a basket. The rising hot air allowed the balloon to be lighter than air, which works using similar mechanics to Chinese lanterns. The first passengers in the balloon were a sheep, rooster and a duck. Travelling to an altitude of roughly 6,000 feet and crossing a distance of over one mile. After their successful flight, the brothers began sending people up in balloons and the first manned flight was on November 21st, 1783. Now heading over to Germany, Otto Lilienthal is hailed to be the first successful aviator. His research was on birds and aerofoils and he founded the science of wing aerodynamics and laid the foundations for concepts still used in modern plane design. His research is what inspired the Wright brothers to build many gliders and the allegedly first powered flight, but this topic is to be broached shortly. Otto is credited with being the first man to successfully build and use gliders to extend unpowered flight. He took inspiration for his glider designs from the various birds he studied from childhood. Across his life, Otto completed over 2,000 flights in over 16 types of glider. He met his unfortunate end when he stalled and broke his back, and he died the next day. So that brings us to the end of the pre-aviation era. 
We covered kites and their uses, Da Vinci's plans for heavier than air flight, hot air balloons and flying sheep, and gliders. The next section covers the birth of modern aviation through to the current day. Each decade during the 20th century could be a documentary of itself, so I will only be scratching the surface. Search Google for the birth of aviation and you'll no doubt get told it started with the legendary Wright brothers and the Wright Flyer. As this is an important point in the history books, I'm going to quickly cover it, but know this, you've been lied to. Orville and Wilbur Wright, two American aviation pioneers who were credited with the world's first successful motor-operated aeroplane. In this picture you can see Orville piloting with Wilbur running alongside the Wright Flyer 1. This picture was taken on December 17, 1903. By October 1905, uh, with the Wright Flyer No. 3, they have managed to stay airborne until the plane ran out of fuel, for a total of 33 minutes and 17 seconds. The Wright brothers' first flight was only 12 seconds. On the other hand, Gustav Whitehead reportedly maintained one and a half minutes of sustained powered heavier than air flight two years prior in 1901. There was no photographer present during the day but there were three reporters, two of which followed the flying machine on their bicycles. Strangely it didn't make front page news, instead appearing on page 5. The credit for the image here goes to the Wright Brothers official website. It is currently accepted by many that White's had that, excuse me, Whitehead was in fact the first person to maintain powered heavier than air flight. However, the Smithsonian has yet to alter their version of history as a contract was signed between the museum and the Wright brothers which prevents the keepers of history from declaring anyone other than the devious duo as the first pilots behind a propeller. Really, they were in front of a propeller um, because the propellers were behind them, but that's by the by. Not long after the invention of heavier than air flight, I struggle pronouncing this name, Guizhou Riche successfully created a gyroplane, which is a type of helicopter that was capable of lifting a person a whopping 60 centimeters from the ground. The image you can see here is a model representation of the real thing. And as you can see, its design was pretty impractical. Luckily, in the same year, Paul Cornu made a helicopter with less rotors. But as you'll see in the next slide, it was still impractical. However, this marked the beginning of helicopters with many leaps in rotor technology to come. Yeah, so the less said about this helicopter, the better. Unfortunately, I'll only be touching on helicopters in this presentation. However, I may do a presentation dedicated to the history of helicopters if that's something people are interested in. Right, the world wars. Okay. There is so much to talk about with the world wars and unfortunately I do not... The flight is not long enough, so I've had to greatly reduce the amount of content that's in this. During the First World War, aviation was still quite new, and so planes were initially used for reconnaissance. It didn't take long before guns were bolted to the airframe. In the earliest days of combat flight, the co-pilot would literally throw bombs over the side of the aircraft in the hope of hitting valuable targets. Dogfighting was not straightforward during these times, as forward-mounted machine guns were known to hit the rotor blade and careless rear-facing gunners could shoot the tail of their own plane. During the Second World War, trench-based fighting was much less common. This was partly fueled by the innovations in aviation. Long-range bombers such as the Lancaster, aircraft carriers allowing, enemy, allowing attacks deep behind enemy lines and so much more. During the Second World War, aeroplane design moved away from the slower biplane to a sleeker, more aerodynamic design. A big change was the addition of cockpit roof. Previously, pilots were out in the elements battling against wind, rain and airborne debris. Make no mistake, being a combat pilot was still a dangerous career path. Also, I'd like to take this moment to make a special mention of the Antonov A-40. 
Yes. That is a flying tank. But more correctly, that is a gliding tank. Why have you decided not to go full screen anymore? There we go. As we leave the Second World War behind, I'm going to touch on a couple of aircraft that have significance to me personally. There are so many incredible innovations that have happened over the past 50 years. The things I could do with a TV crew and a budget. Anyway, the first of these notable aeroplanes is the Lockheed C-130 Hercules. Taking its first flight in 1954, this incredibly engineered plane is still active today. There are over 70 variants of the C-130 and over 2,500 of these planes have been made. I will be covering the Herculean... Ah. Bugger. Uh, one tree tree, decimal four five for penguin one one two tree. One tree, tree Apologies. Okay. Uh, oh, I forgot to get the... There we go. I forgot to get the uh, thing back up. Right. I will be covering the Herculean turboprop later in, in a later presentation, including the infamous rocket-assisted landing. Heading over to 1957, the short SC-1 was the first fixed-wing aircraft to be cap capable of vertical takeoff and landing. The most famous fixed-wing aircraft capable of this is the Harrier jump jet, but that didn't come about until 10 years later in 1967. The short SC-1 was developed by the Short Brothers in response to a mini Ministry of Supply requirement for an aircraft to study VTOL and specifically the transition between vertical and horizontal flight. Unlike the Harrier, the short SC-1 had four vertically mounted lift engines which would be shut down during conventional flight. If you'd like to watch a video of this aeroplane in action, check out the link I've put in the video description. Nineteen sixty nine. 1969 was probably the most important day in all of human history. It was the first time man stepped on extra terra firma. It was when we as a species visited the moon, accomplishing incredible feats of engineering and learning new things about the solar system and our place within it. However, this is a presentation on aviation, not aerospace. In the same year, Cord uh, Concorde took her maiden flight. Concorde was the first supersonic passenger commercial aeroplane, capable of travelling Mach 2.04, which is 1,354 miles per hour, at twice the speed of sound. It would take roughly three hours to travel from London to, to New York, something that would take my Airbus two trips and a whole lot longer. The costs to develop Concorde were so great that when the final plane was retired in 2003, it still wasn't profitable. Over the next 40 years, there have been absolute incredible leaps and bounds taken within the civil aviation and military aviation, some of which including TCAS, which is um, an aircraft anti-collision system. Uh, improvements in radar, autopilot, self-landing systems. You've also got stealth, um, quick response um, aviation, and many, many leaps. Just too many for me in my little stream to cover. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to be quite brief about it. Jumping forward to 2005... Airbus unveiled the A380, a direct competitor to the Boeing 747, which had previously been the largest capacity passenger aeroplane. Boeing's dominance with the 747 had notably impacted Airbus's own sales, so they spent 9.5 billion euros developing the A380 program. However, due to difficulties in the electrical wiring, it caused a two-year delay and the development costs soared to 18 billion euros. And yes, that pun was intended. 
And uh, just as a personal aside, my dad used to manufacture components for the Airbus A380. So I have a soft spot for the lumbering beast, even if I do think it looks a bit ugly. Moving forward to something that happened incredibly recently, only last Friday, Kelly Aerospace opened the pre-orders for the world's first unmanned supersonic combat drone. The drone would be capable of flying just faster than Concorde was at Mach 2.1. Except this drone has no pilot. It is a vision of things to come within the military aviation industry, but also the civil aviation industry, as we'll discuss next. Uh, apologies, I wasn't sure whether that was for me. No, that wasn't for me. Let's, um... Let's go. Let's go! Okay, so, we've reached the final section of, our, of the presentation, the future of aviation. You may recognize the GIF playing in the background as originating from Airplane, the 1980 disaster spoof film. I picked this GIF for a good reason. For those of you who have seen the film, you may remember after the plane is safely on the ground, the film ends with the inflatable autopilot and an inflatable cabin crew taking off and flying into the sunset. This is surprisingly prophetic. In a document presented to Parliament by the Secretary of State for Transport holds the future of aviation. That being automation, electrification and data collection. Within the report it says 70% of commercial aeroplane incidents are born as a result of human error. Automation could help reduce the occasions where loss of life was avoidable. Planes can already fly themselves, as you can see by my Airbus, which is still doing a pretty good job of keeping itself on track. Uh, some can land themselves, and some can even take off without any pilot input. I personally believe that the future of aviation will require all aircraft to be capable of flying without a pilot in the cockpit. Moving on to the electrification. As we attempt to tackle climate change, one obvious area of improvement is the millions of tons of greenhouse... <sighs> Apologies. 125 decimal zero five for Penguin 1123. Just need to contact Edmonton Center. Edmonton Center Check out we got, we got time. We got time. Okay, so um, as we attempt to tackle climate change, one obvious area of improvement is the millions of tons of greenhouse gases, um, uh, greenhouse emissions, sorry, made by planes every year. Going forward, planes will run purely on electrical power, just as cars will. In fact, in 2010, Solar Impulse 1 achieved 26 hours of continuous solar-powered flights. On top of this, it is believed that a return to supersonic and even hypersonic flight will be... Uh, will, will, uh, excuse me... Uh, there will be a return to supersonic and hypersonic flight, with aircraft travelling over five times the speed of sound. Those kinds of speeds would reduce flight time to Australia to just five hours. It's also believed that hypersonic speeds would reduce aircraft emissions. And finally, my own personal prediction is that we'll eventually see quadcopters, no generally as drones, become a method of personal transport. There are already companies and individuals working on air taxis and flying cars, most of which are variations on the quadcopter. And now I get to hear your thoughts. What do you think the future holds for aviation? Please let me know in the chat, and I'll also be answering any questions you might have on the presentation. And meanwhile, I'll be having a drink.
<laughs> Uber copters, yes, definitely. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes just to uh, add anything that you might want. Better check on the flight as well. Would the captain like a cuppa? Uh, no thanks, I've still got a drink. Okay, so... I'd like to thank you for joining me in the first... Oh, I've just realised that I've got the wrong screen up. I'd like to thank you for joining me um, in the first Penguin original production. Please leave your feedback in the live chat or comment section as I'd love to know what you thought about the presentation. I'm now going to flick back to Microsoft Flight Simulator and continue with the Charlie Yankee X-Ray Echo to Charlie Yankee Yankee Charlie Flight Plan. That is Saskatoon to Calgary. Thank you very much. And to answer your question, Hellmonkey, yes, I, I definitely am. Because as I was learning about some of the areas of um, World War One and World War II history, I, I was blown away by all the crazy things that happened during, uh, especially World War II. There was a real, there was a real push for innovation, uh, including flying tanks. I mean, that tank. So what happened was that tank actually existed, and it was meant to be towed by an aircraft, uh, the largest Russian aircraft available at the time. I can't remember the name, unfortunately. And. Um, what happened was the tank was causing so much drag, the tow aircraft had to um, ditch the glider that it was attached to um, because it could not gain altitude. But reports say that the tank at that point continued to glide and made a gentle landing all on its own, which is incredible. And since then, they have made tanks that are capable of being dropped from airplanes and stuff like that. Obviously, we're not talking about airplanes now. I'm specifically mentioning tanks, but that's just one example. There are also airplanes that take off... Uh, how do I say this? Where, where most aircraft look like this when they've landed, you know, they, they lay horizontal, there are aircraft that were developed to take off from aircraft carriers that actually... Um, I don't even know if I can rotate this camera in the way that I'd need to. They would take off directly upwards. And they would try and land direct, almost like a VTOL, but not, because it would be propeller. I'd also love to cover some of the, um, well, yes, VTOL, but quite literally in the sense that the plane would go up vertically. Not as in it would, it would hover vertically. Um... But yes, they were too unstable, so they it never became a big, uh, big aspect of um, of aviation. But yes, I'd also love to cover some of the stratos, the stratosphere capable aircraft as well. Yes, I'm using the ultra low latency, so it's about five seconds when I tested it, but it might it might be variable. I'm not sure. Um, I also plan to go in more detail about specific areas of aviation, so not just about history of aviation. So I was planning for next week maybe doing a just a brief overview of the a brief overview of the physics behind flying. But uh, yeah, so make sure you leave your feedback on the presentation um, because that lets me know what to do for next time. I am going to go ahead and let people know that the presentation is over. I am so grateful for everyone who um, yes definitely the, with the Harrier jump jet yes um, 
I remember the first time I saw a Harrier jump jet. It was at an air festival. I think it was at Yeovil, possibly. I believe it was, might have been Yeovil. And um, I was absolutely blown away by it. Absolutely blown away. But this aeroplane can go straight up. Like, that's so strange. Um, but yes. Oh, it looks like we are almost ready to... I would love to do helicopters, Sammy. I'd love to do helicopters. Absolutely willing to do some more stuff on helicopters. I didn't do much research on helicopters because that is a whole... That's a whole nother can of worms that um, I would love to visit specifically another day. Um, what was I doing? Oh yes, I was going to send out a tweet to let people know. No, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, um, I'm really glad that anyone... Uh, I'm really glad that I've helped anyone learn something new today and that it's been interesting. I've really enjoyed doing this. I've, it's been wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, yeah, well, I'll definitely try and sort something out for next time. And Sammy... Uh, just to go back to your question, I, I obviously have to do heli- I mean, I didn't even talk about the Chinook, I didn't talk about the Huey, I didn't talk about um, the Black Hawk, I didn't talk about the, uh, what's it called? Not the Meg, that Russian one. Oh, I've forgotten what it's called. But yes, I would definitely be doing a presentation on helicopters specifically and the history of helicopters okay so let's just double check we're all good military aircraft i'm certainly happy to have a look at military aircraft as well um there's a lot of interesting aircraft such as the Oh, I've forgotten the name of it. Boeing, I think it's BA-300 or something like that, which is that, but it looks, it looks a bit like this. Well, this is an Airbus, but, um, but it looks a bit like this and it's got that great big radar dish above it. So yeah, um, I definitely cover some military aircraft, including like the Eurofighter Typhoon and if there's, uh, the Typhoon's actually purchasable on here. Unfortunately, I don't think so, Jem, but there's nothing stopping you from uh, from flying alongside me. Get yourself in like in a... Uh, in the... Get yourself in a fighter jet and you can escort me to my destinations. So I'm going to go ahead and check the wind again because, oh my goodness, it's picked up. We're looking at 30 knots of headwind <laughs> flying to me. I'll have to make sure I turn collisions off. So I believe Calgary should be coming up soon. The, the, the city of Calgary should be coming up. Soon, I believe it's over there.
<laughs> I can tell you that the world isn't flat. You can see the curvature of the Earth when you zoom out far enough. And even if I zoom in, you can just about make out the curve. GTA is a finite um, space. This is the whole world. Why have my engines just uh, gone all quiet all of a sudden? I, I couldn't, I couldn't answer that question, I'm afraid, Vivi. Um, so I've just worked out why the engine, it went idle, it didn't die. Um, the engines went idle because um, I reached the target altitude, which apparently I wasn't at before, so it slowed down to the cruise speed of 240 knots, whereas the climb speed is set on here. Climb speed is... Oh, I can't... For some reason it doesn't want to let me see. Well, the climb speed isn't 240 knots, that's all I can say. <laughs> oh, we're starting to get the mountains. I think I might turn on my uh, hammer in a bit. Now in case you haven't seen on Twitter, we have got roughly 20 minutes, uh, a little bit less now, until we should be on the ground. Oh no, apparently, according to the, my in-flight computer, we got half an hour until we're on the ground. Oops. Someone forgot to turn off his Steam notifications. I've really got to set up head tracking on this game. <laughs> you know you can... You know internet goes all the way up to satellites, don't you? I don't know whether you could play Stadia whilst flying. Maybe with Skynet it's possible, I, I don't know. Also, just a heads up, as I get closer to the airport, the game does something strange where it keeps handle it keeps making me contact people multiple times. So it will say contact Edmonton Centre, contact Calgary, contact Edmonton, contact Calgary. I don't know why it does it, I have to do it though, because otherwise it just moans at me um, to, to do it. Right, right now you can see this tail is just kicked out to the left a bit. Uh, to the right, even. That's because of the tremendous headwind I've got right now. 32 knots. I'm travelling at 240 knots. But according to um, my true airspeed indicator, which is this here, I'm travelling at 302 knots. Look at this, the mountains are coming. Honestly, it's such a beautiful sight seeing these mountains. And uh, today's landing is gonna be a bit rough. I can tell you that because I've already tried landing today and the weather hasn't changed much. In fact, it's gotten worse. Um, we might have two landings, that's uh, where you bounce. Uh, there's a very good chance that we'll have two landings. There is also a small chance that I might crash the plane 
and flight sim will say, oh no, you crashed. One tree tree decimal tree for penguin one one two tree. One tree tree decimal tree penguin one one two tree. Edmonton Center penguin one one two tree sixteen thousand feet. Penguin one one two tree Edmonton Center continue to tow on as planned. Altimeter tree zero decimal zero one. Strangely, we haven't got anyone around, anyone else flying. Oh no, there they are, they all just popped in. Let's see if we can spot them. Oh, we're not going to spot them, they're too far away. Damn those one, one, two, three trees, yeah. <laughs> No, I'll leave the uh, I'll leave the aircraft name off just in case. You never know what people name themselves on Steam. Morning Ooh, we got a bit of turbulence. I don't know if any of you are interested, but uh, these little wing tips here, they're called sharklets. And they were designed specifically for the Airbus A320. Um, and they reduce drag, because what happens is when you fly a plane, these wings will flex. And as they flex, it changes the aerofoil, which is the shape of the wing. And... Um, these prevent it from flexing as far, which means it reduces the amount of drag and increases the fuel efficiency. So where it says unbeatable fuel efficiency on the side, it's true. I don't believe there is a more, more fuel efficient passenger airliner out there. Hey Ruben, thanks for joining. And thank you all for joining. If I haven't mentioned you by name, I apologise, but... Uh, I really appreciate you all being here, and I hope you're enjoying a, a slightly different stream to what you're used to, I imagine. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'll have to get out a... Uh, I'll, I'll have to get a graphics tablet or something and start drawing diagrams about uh, air tumbling over the wing and um, pressure differentials and stuff like that. Okay, so I believe that is the town of Calgary. Well, that's the city of Calgary, I believe. Apologies, Brent. <laughs> I could be wrong, that might just be a little village. It might be that Calgary's actually over there. I, I'm, I'm a bit turned around. Especially considering I've never been to Canada, other than digitally. <laughs> yes. 
Thank God it's upside down, Sammy. If it was the other way around, uh, the, all the F1 cars would be taking off. They go fast enough to. I wonder if they've tried it, Sammy. I'm curious to know if they've used a... What are they worth? Like 10 million... 10 million pounds each? I wonder if they've tried using a 10 million pound car to drive on the roof of a tunnel. So yes, this, this must be Calgary, because as you can see, it's quite built up. Um, as we get towards our approach stage, we'll start descending, and you're going to see more of them. And it starts to look... You can already start seeing it. It starts to look a bit like a hedge maze, in my opinion. I'm going to stop moving the camera so much because there's some beautiful vistas and I can't imagine it's very pleasant me keep moving the camera. Um, just out of interest, if anyone can tell me, is this stream available in 1080p60 or, or is it not? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Vivi. Also, like I said, um, as Garth has made this flight um, many times, and so has Brent, I'm not taking the straight, straight in approach. Straight in approach would have come up this way, and we would have gone straight in through ILS. I am using a different, uh, it's called an arrival pattern. And the only reason I'm taking this pattern is just because it takes us over the mountains for a short while and because it looks beautiful. It only takes an extra, what, 10, 15, no, 15, 20 minutes, this route, but it's worth it. It really is worth it. Uh, I'm using 10,000, 10,000 KB kilobits, 10, 000, I think I'm using 10,000 kilobits. I said I was going to stop moving the camera, and then I start moving the camera again. This airport's actually getting quite busy. Just out of interest, um, how come you have to fly this route so often? If that's not being nosy. Well, it is being nosy. If that's not being too personal.
Oh, okay, so you, uh, you work in Los Angeles, but you go to Calgary. But Calgary's west. Calgary's west of Saskatoon. Isn't, I mean, I'm not very good with my um, American and Canadian geography, but isn't, um, surely New York is, is south of those places. Oh, that makes sense. Saskatoon does seem like quite a small airport, especially compared to Calgary. So yes, this is what I was on about, about the beautiful vista. I'm going to go ahead and snap a screenshot. Okay, so let's go ahead and as you can see here, let me reduce the range. We are currently turning to head towards our base leg. Uh, base leg is, I can't show you on that map, I'm going to have to show you on this one. Okay. So this is the runway that we're going to be landing on. We're landing on runway 17 left. This one just here. But this airport has a traffic pattern. There are names for each of the legs. I can't remember them. I just remembered that the one where you travel parallel to the runway is called the base leg. Oh, this one is called final. That's when you're on final approach. It means you are in line with the runway and you are coming in to land. We are just about to start turning. We will start descending around this waypoint. So roughly when we're in line with the airport. And take this out of the way. One two decimal one five for penguin one one two three. One two seven decimal one five for penguin one one two three. Oh, I forgot to actually tune to that <laughs> to that frequency. Approach penguin one one two three sixteen thousand feet. Penguin one one two three approach. Continue to orbit like your plan. No worries, Sammy. Have fun. It was great to have you, um, it's great to have you join me. And this is where it starts mucking about, because now it's told me to contact the people that had just handed me off to someone else.
Oh, that turbulence is getting bad. We're getting a bit shaky. See that? That there is turbulence. That's what a plane looks like when it hits turbulence. I think one of the main influences of that is the fact that we've now got a 36 knot tailwind. <laughs> oh my god, Brent. I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate your um your faith. Your unshaking and unwavering unwavering faith in my ability to land this this beast though I, I will point out 30 knots is faster crosswind than I've ever landed a plane in before it might even be an idea to change which runway I land in I'd much rather land on a short runway ah I mean I might be able to land that one Descend and maintain 7,000 feet. Penguin 1123. Descend and maintain 7,000 feet. Penguin 1123. Penguin 1123. Descend and maintain 7,100 feet. Okay. Descend and maintain 7,100 feet. Penguin 1123. Descend and maintain 7,100 feet. I I hope I'll be able to land too. I I think I'll be okay, but you never know. Um, I don't think I need to put any of that on. Oh, I forgot to turn the uh, got to turn my seatbelt lights off. All my passengers have been sat in their seats for the whole journey. It's only been an hour. To be fair, I've I've needed uh, to pee for a little while now. One two seven decimal one five for penguin one one two three. Okay. Calgary approach penguin one one two three with you at I don't know my current altitude. With you at fourteen thousand two hundred feet, descending to seven thousand feet. Approach penguin one one two three is at fourteen thousand one hundred feet, descending seven thousand one hundred feet. Penguin one one two three approach. Continue to name on as planned. Altimeter two nine or decimal nine or three. Penguin one one. There we go. There's Calgary. Descend and maintain 8,000 feet. Keep speed below 210 knots. Penguin 1123. Descend and maintain 8,000 feet. Keep speed below 210 knots. Penguin. And here is the hedge maze town layout. I can't do a loop in this plane now. I would, I would destroy the plane. I would overstress it and it would end the game. I'm afraid. I'm going to go ahead and take a screenshot of this. Push that bit right too. Okay, so we should be... We could really do with descending a little bit quicker, but never mind. I'm going to go ahead now and change this to the Rose uh, ILS view. Change the range. So just a quick explanation of what this is. This purple line is the runway that I'm going to be landing on. When that purple line is perfectly in line with these two, it means I am in line with the runway. <laughs> uh, I would need to look up where Google Studios even is. It's 
not something I, I know offhand. Um, the other thing that has changed is you'll see these five, well, four dots and a line. Oh, there's the little bit of purple. That is my glide slope. And I'll be aiming to get the purple diamond exactly in the middle. And if I do that here, which you'll also see here. And I also have one here, which is another way of showing me when I'm perfectly in line with the runway. This looks like something I would make on city skylines, this um, city layout. I love it. But it still looks too perfect for some reason. Like, like these perfectly straight roads. Okay. So we are roughly five minutes away from landing, possibly. Let me just check the flight computer. Yeah, so it thinks we're going to land within the next five minutes. Exciting times, because now we are facing 30, 33 knots of... Uh, it's actually not just satellite imagery. It is also... Um, it's also road view, a bit like Google Street View, but it's the Bing version. So whilst I'm playing this, it is constantly downloading... Um, it's constantly downloading the local area data. Hey Nathan, how you doing? Thanks for joining. We're... Oh, I forgot to mention on my Twitter that we are about to land. Descend and maintain 7,100 feet. Descend and maintain 7,100 feet. Penguin 1123. I mean, I'm already heading to that altitude anyway. So we've just received our clearance. We are almost perfectly on the glide slope. Uh, no, I'm not going to do it just yet. Not just yet. I'm going to wait until we... this over so you can see what we're doing we're about to turn to Victi and at that point we will be captured by the um, ILS and I can go ahead and turn on approach mode and the plane will basically land itself but right near the end of the approach I will take control because there is far too much wind for this plane to land itself at the minute gonna take that back off the screen So we're making our final turn onto the oh we're making our turn onto final I better go ahead and turn my camera on as well so you can see me take control of the aircraft. Well, there's, there's, there's every chance that I will crash, if I'm honest. Okay. So, 
we've actually just been captured by the ILS. Oh no, no we haven't, not yet. Little purple, um, little purple letters pop up here when we have, that's my mistake. We are 15 miles away from, our, nautical miles that is, away from the airport. Five thousand eight hundred feet, Penguin one one two three. Oh, didn't click the button. Descend and maintain five thousand eight hundred feet, Penguin one one two three. Got traffic. He came out of absolutely nowhere. Hopefully, he's not in our way. He's a that could be him, but I don't think it is. So I'm going to go ahead and press the approach key. Okay, so we are on the glide slope now. And we are almost perfectly in line with the runway. So if we look ahead, we should see the runway. There it is. Those tiny little flashing lights just there. So I'm going to go ahead and put some flaps on. To be fair, we should have already had the landing gear down. That's naughty, Adam. inbound though we do have traffic so I'm gonna go ahead and tune I'm gonna go ahead and contact Calgary Tower to let them know that we are on our approach you see how much the planes drifting now let's see what this wind is oh thankfully it's almost a headwind with 23 knots 23 knots coming from this direction I uh, yeah, okay. Maybe. Cleared ILS runway one seven left approach penguin one one two three. Okay, so the plane is now going to follow this pink dot, this pinky purple dot, and at the same time try and keep us in line with the runway despite the turbulence. When we reach five hundred feet from the ground, he'll call out five hundred. That's this number here, not this one. When we reach five hundred feet from the ground, that is when I have to decide whether we go ahead and land or whether we go around. Clear to land runway 17 left. We, uh, penguin 1123. I did put the flaps down, didn't I? Because it doesn't look like it did. Okay, here we go. We're at 1,000 feet. Okay, fingers crossed. Okay, we're at 500 feet. We are dragging quite a bit, but I'm going to go ahead and we're going to land this plane. So that's me disconnecting the autopilot. I'm going to idle the engines. Pull back slightly because I don't want to come in too hard. Okay. 
we're going to go full reverse. And we did it. We're down. Got the brakes on, got full reverse thrust. Go ahead and turn reverse thrust off. Turn next taxiway. Come on, tell me to turn. It's supposed to tell me to turn off on the taxiway. Oh. After I've already missed it. Okay. Go ahead and go back into first person view. Lift up the flaps. I'm sorry you didn't get to see me crash. To be fair, the plane hasn't been turned off yet, so it could still happen. One two five decimal three five penguin one one two three. Going to one two five decimal three five penguin one one two three. Okay, so I'm going to contact ground. I'm going to request to go to the gates, and we're going to go ahead and turn off the. Uh, we're going to go ahead and turn off the airplane, and then that will be the end of the stream. Taxi to gate two four using taxiway Sierra Delta penguin one one two three. Check that there's no one using the taxiway. Oh, I can't do it that well with my hat. Looks like we're okay. Remember to turn off the lights. Yes. Okay. So the seatbelt light stays on. We don't need the wing ice light. We don't need anti icing on and uh, we don't oh we do need the beacon light on uh taxi nose light okay there we go so now we can whoopsie daisy <laughs> of course that happened that's embarrassing all right come on let's get this beat. Well, in fairness, VV, there would be a co-pilot turning the lights off. I have no choice. Planes like these are never flown solo. There's too many systems to look after for one person.
Oh, you get to see the little guy now with the um, thingies. I've just started learning what he's saying. So turn right. Right, keep coming, keep coming. Slow. Now oh, he wants me to keep going a bit more. I'll go ahead and put the parking brake on. <laughs> In fairness, he's pretty far back. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn my lights off. I'm going to connect to the external power. Uh, all that lights off. Off. Oops, I'm going to turn that on. No, no. That is... Seatbelt lights off. Uh, we can go ahead and turn the engines off. Oh, and there we go. That ended a bit quicker than usual. Usually it lets me turn the power off, but um, yeah. I, uh, I'm really pleased with how it all went. I really appreciate all of you who stopped by to watch the presentation and just to watch any part of the flight. Uh, I can't wait for next week's. I haven't decided what I'm doing next week, but I, I might do VFR in something a bit smaller. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it's a surprise. Um, please leave some feedback on the presentation, whether on my Twitter or as a comment on the video. Um... But yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. I haven't got a, I haven't got an effective way of ending my streams yet. So uh, I guess I'm just going to have to say goodbye and I'll see you next time. Bye.